Today we are going to be discussing the high age of European imperialism, specifically in Africa. Our bookends are 1807, the outlaw of the international slave trade, to the beginning of World War I in 1914. First, let's define imperialism. In its broadest definition, imperialism is when one group of people takes over another group of people's natural and or human resources for its own gain. I'll say it again. When one group of people takes over another group of people's natural and or human resources for its own gain. Europeans did not invent imperialism. Most groups of people have experienced imperialism at some point, whether they are being colonized or doing the colonizing. Now that we have a basic definition, we can specifically talk about its many forms during this era. We will discuss the types of imperialism, the reasons for imperialism, and finally, the impact of imperialism on the Africans. Imperialism has three distinct forms, but are often used in conjunction with one another. They are one, formal, through conquest or war. Example, my people go to war with your people, my people win. My people control your land and resources. Number two, informal is through economic domination. Example, my people meet your people. We see that you have diamond mines. We lease you the mining equipment. We pay you to mine it. We keep the diamonds and sell them at a large profit and force you to sign a treaty prohibiting any other people from mining your diamonds. We now have a monopoly on your diamonds. And number three is cultural. My people's culture dominates yours. Now this is a good time to define assimilation and compare it to cultural diffusion. When two or more cultures come into contact with one another, naturally some of each other's culture gets adopted by the other, and that's generally considered a good thing. That's cultural diffusion. Assimilation, on the other hand, is when two or more cultures come into contact with one another and one culture forces the other to adopt their culture. They often intentionally force out the other culture by forbidding the people to speak their native language or outlawing cultural practices. That's assimilation and is generally considered negative. Specifically, when talking about the high age of European imperialism in Africa, we should ask ourselves, how is it that, quote, enlightened people engage in imperialism when it seemingly goes against enlightenment ideas of all human beings being equal? I will posit that a commonly held belief or myth was prevalent among Europeans that they were superior to all other cultures. Now, to be fair, not all Europeans agreed with this idea. We will discuss some of the critics later, in fact. And we're not agreeing with this idea either. That is why we are calling it a myth. There were several other concepts developed that seemed to support this myth and or imperialism in general. Let's take a look. First, we have social Darwinism, a concept that applies to Charles Darwin's theories of evolution and Jean-Baptiste Lamarck's ideas of directed adaptation to different cultures, races, ethnicities, classes, etc. So who are Darwin and Lamarck? Darwin believed that over long periods of time, different animal species adapt to their surroundings to survive. These species that can't or don't may become extinct, and there's nothing we can do about it. Lamarck, who actually published before Darwin, said, that species could pass on adaptations to their offspring in order to survive. He also believed that you could direct, quote unquote, adaptation to ensure species survival. He would have supported breeding animals in captivity for this purpose. Both scientists did not intend for their concepts to be applied to societies and humans. It was people like Herbert Spencer and Francis Galton who would bastardize Darwin and Lamarck's ideas. This brings us to eugenics. Galton was the founder of this pseudoscience. 
Eugenicists believe that you could improve society by controlled breeding to increase desirable inheritable characteristics. Likewise, prohibiting breeding of people who have supposed, quote, undesirable inheritable characteristics. What does this mean exactly? Take a look at the chart on the left of the slide. It seems to be comparing a known criminal's brain, defined as, quote, sex pervert, vagrant, end quote, to that of a normal or non-criminal brain. This could lead to a number of practices that would seem perverse to us. Do you sterilize criminals so they don't pass on their, quote, criminal traits to their offspring? Do you scan people's brains at a certain age, and if, you have, and if they have the criminal brain, do you lock them up even if they haven't committed a crime? Eugenics seems to suggest that nature or bio biology is destiny. It definitely leaves out the nurture side of the equation. So who is Carl Pearson? And how does he support the myth of European superiority? Pearson claimed that he had evidence that Europeans were smarter than Africans. What evidence? He studied skull sizes and therefore brain sizes. He starts with a hypothesis that bigger brain equals smarter. Now that may sound a little sketchy to us, but think about how that idea is still with us today. When someone, usually a small child, insults another by calling him or her a pea brain, what they are suggesting is that the person has the brain a size of a pea and therefore is dumb or stupid. Another example would be someone who is supposedly extremely intelligent. In cartoons, they are often drawn with large heads. Think brain of Pinky of the Brain or Dr. Finkelstein of The Nightmare Before Christmas. So let's pretend that we agree with per Pearson's hypothesis that bigger brain equals more intelligent. How does he prove this? He takes a sample cross-section of African skulls and he compares them to a similar sample cross-section of European skulls. He says that on average, European skulls are larger. So at this time, his, his evidence seems to prove his hypothesis. So, okay. Now here's the part that completely discredits him. He doesn't disclose that he included mostly children in the African samples and mostly adults in the European samples. Yep, that's right. He skewed his evidence. Not science at all. So we have a bastardization of Darwin and Lamarck and a real science being bastardized and a pseudoscience of eugenics to support this myth of European superiority. Next, we have a concept that comes from the world of literature, white man's burden. This derives from Kipling's poem of the same name in which he refers to non-Europeans as half devil and half child, giving us not just justification for imperialism, but the poem suggests that it is a noble thing to do. He said it is a job or responsibility of the white man to teach non-whites what they need to know in life, just as a parent would teach a child. Likewise, the half-devil has religious justifications, and that's where missionaries come in. So missionaries would go to Africa and Asia in an effort to convert them to Christianity. As a Christian, you want your fellow humans to get to heaven. Christians believe that to do so, you must believe in Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, not converting people is akin to wishing people to rotten hell. Not very Christian. Now we can begin to talk about European imperialism in Africa specifically. In order to do that, we first need to look at African societies before European conquest. It turns out that is not such an easy thing to do. Africa is a huge continent and its peoples are as diverse as its landscape. Therefore, it is really hard to make general statements about Africa. Typically, the way we simplify this is to break Africa into regions. Usually we divide Africa from north to south at the Saharan Desert. We also talk about Africa in terms of east-west. This is the map of Africa at the beginning of the high age of European imperialism. Note that there are some colonies, but are they are mostly located around the coast. This is because Africa was first known by the Europeans as, quote, the white man's grave. 
This refers to the 1700s and the height of the transatlantic slave trade. Europeans could not travel too far into the interior of Africa for fear they would contract malaria or other diseases that would kill Europeans. Their bodies simply did not have the immunity to it that the Africans did. They relied on Africans to act as, quote, middlemen during the transatlantic slave trade. Two things would change this. First, the discovery of quinine, which aided in the treatment for malaria, allowing explorers like Cecil Rhodes and David Livingston to explore the interior of Africa. Second, the outline of the international slave trade in 1807. This forced Europeans who wished to continue to trade with Africa to look for, quote unquote, legitimate trade or commodities like rubber, palm oil, gold, not human beings. Before the Europeans arrived in Africa, the first contact with outsiders were Muslim traders in North Africa. Thus, in North Africa, Islam is the dominant religion. Next comes the Europeans who come to dominate the transatlantic slave trade until 1807. Once the slave trade ended, Britain and France were quick to set up colonies, as were the Spanish, Portuguese, and the Turks. Most of the time, Europeans did not fight each other over the colonies, with the notable exception of the Boer Wars in South Africa. That did not mean, however, there were not disputes. In 1884, when a dispute over the Congo between King Leopold II of Belgium and German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck of Germany came close to war, Bismarck called together all the heads of state of the major powers of Europe to settle the dispute through diplomacy. The decision of allowing Belgium to colonize the Congo, Congo since they were there first, sets the precedent that whichever European power got to land first would keep it thus beginning the scramble for Europeans to conquer African lands not yet claimed by other Europeans. Within a span of approximately 30 years, much of Africa was under European control with little to no regard for tribal or ethnic borders of the indigenous peoples of Africa. Only two places were independent, Liberia, which was populated with newly freed US slaves, who had the means and the desire to do so, and Ethiopia, the feel-good story for today. The Italians tried to imperialize Ethiopia first through informal imperialism with trade treaties that favored Italy. When the emperor, Menelik II, refused to sign because he was fluent in Italian and therefore could not be tricked, the Italians invaded. Menelik and the Ethiopians fought the Italians and won. Here's a map of Africa under full partition in 1912. Note Liberia in West Africa and Ethiopia here on the east. Also note that Britain and France had the lion's share, but mostly stayed away from each other. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two maps of Africa. They show the change that occurred between the Berlin Conference in 1884 and 1912, the eve of World War I. Not all European countries ran their colonies the same way. Therefore, the indigenous Africans' experience varied based on which European colony ruled them. We will compare the French and the British. The French viewed their colonies as an extension of France and wanted to replicate life in France and her colonies. Therefore, they attempted to assimilate indigenous Africans into their culture by forcing them to speak French only, wear Western clothing, and convert to Christianity. They also had settlers or colons, people from France who moved there and often enjoyed much better lives than they would have had they stayed in France. They had all of the best land and benefited from much of the technology brought to Africa. This left less land and fewer jobs for the indigenous Africans. Conversely, the British, generally speaking, had fewer settlers and cared little if the indigenous Africans adopted their culture. The areas where the British settled were more about their locations. Refer to the map on slide eight. 
Note the British are primarily in the southern in southern Africa and eastern Africa. Both are on pivotal points on important waterways. Southern Africa links the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. Eastern Africa links the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean, and after the Suez Canal is built, the Mediterranean to the Red Sea. Britain used control of these places to solidify its domination of the seas. Britain ruled its African colonies by indirect rule, which means they set up a government and a police force, but relied on local leaders to carry out the administration. Now, you might think that that with little white settlement, the situation for Africans living in British colonies fared better than living in the French colonies. That's not necessarily the case. Often they would favor one indigenous group over the other, or they would import indentured servants from India. Thus, they were very good at divide and conquer. Unfortunately, we cannot discuss every African colony due to time restrictions. If it is something you're interested in, I encourage you to take our African history courses, where you will spend a whole semester on Africa. Therefore, I have chosen Southern Africa as a case study. We can learn about specific events in Southern Africa. The first Europeans to come to Southern Africa were the Dutch in the 1600s. They settled many Dutch subjects who were mostly farmers. These Dutch settlers over several generations would identify less with the Netherlands and more with Southern Africa. These folks were known as the Boers. In the early 1800s, the British arrive and gain control from the Dutch. Between 1835 and 1841, the Boers, not wanting to live as British subjects, moved more inland on what is known as the Great Trek. They formed two colonies, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. The British stick to the coast and name their colonies Natal and Cape Province. Mostly, the four colonies lived peacefully with each other until the late 1800s, when gold was discovered in the Transvaal. This sparked a series of wars known as the Boer Wars, the last between 1899 and 1902. This Boer War was particularly brutal as the two armies were mostly evenly matched. At first, the Boers had an advantage. The civilians often favored them over the British and were more likely to support them with supplies, food, and lodging. When the British realized this, they placed the civilians into internment camps, thus ensuring their victory. Let's watch the short video in which the conditions in these camps are discussed. With the British victory, the four colonies became one formally in 1909. The British were in control, but the Boers stayed on uh, and led a relatively comfortable life compared to that of the indigenous Africans. They owned the best farmland and mining companies that to this day control much of the world's gold and diamonds. There were many critics of imperialism and they oppose it from both a moral argument as well as an economic one. Probably the most famous critic is the writer Joseph Conrad who visited the Congo and saw firsthand the treatment of Africans at the hands of the companies that employed them. Note the picture on the right of the screen of the Congolese children with severed limbs from not making their quotas. Other writers wrote against imperialism who say it violates basic human rights. When U.S. citizens realized that the U.S. was responsible for the deaths of 200,000 Filipino citizens, civilians, in the Philippine-American War in between 1899 and 1902, they protested and influenced the shift in policy in the Philippines to a less formal imperialism with the move for gradual independence. Then there were economic critics like Lenin of Russia. He wrote in 1916 that imperialism was the natural side effect of capitalism, that competition for natural resources forces countries to try to control countries for its resources. And John Hudson, who said it was capitalism's boom and bust cycles were caused by oversaving of the rich, which forced the poor to, quote, underconsume. He says that these unequal distributions of wealth forces countries to seek expansion through empire. Now we are going to discuss the impact of colonization had on indigenous Africans. Generally speaking, there were some positive effects, but mostly it was negative. Let's start with the positive. Indigenous Africans were given Western education as schools were set up in most colonies. 
Sometimes they could achieve more wealth by working for the colonial government. Hospitals and clinics bring Western medicine to the colonies. Finally, paved roads, telephone lines, indoor plumbing certainly improve the standard of living, although it is important to note that the, much of the technology benefited mostly the Europeans. You could also make a case that even education and healthcare came at a price. This brings us to the negative impacts. The loss of land and self-governance, including control of natural resources, tribal dislocation, the borders of the map of Africa split up, many ethnic groups are put together, multiple ethnic groups often that didn't get along. Compulsory labor, as the case with the Belgian Congo, where thousands of Africans were treated as slaves in the rubber plantations. Most significant is the loss of cultural identity, languages dying out, customs being prohibited. These are just a few of the impacts that Europeans had on Africans, many of which still plague Africa today.